and today I'll be talking about obsessive compulsive disorder, which is probably not something that uh, you would not have heard of. I'm sure everybody knows what's OCD. Today I'll give a more in-depth uh, explanation of this condition. I thought to make it interesting, we will do it a slightly different way. Uh, I'm getting Arthur to be part of this whole presentation. It's going to be called uh, 31 Questions with uh, me on OCD. Arthur, are you ready? Ready. Yeah. Tell us about yourself. I think you already <laughs> said a lot about me, so I don't really have a lot to add. But yeah, this SGH um, is part of the Sing Health uh, cluster. I spent actually many, many years of training in Singapore General Hospital under the Department of Psychiatry there. And then about six years ago, I had the great honor to go to Sengkang to set up the department. Really one of a lifetime uh, opportunity. And I get to hire uh, psychiatrists, doctors into my department and uh, come up with some of the policies and processes. And also a few years ago, I went to Stanford University to do my fellowship in eating disorder. Uh, it was again very eye-opening to go to a different center in a different part of the world uh, to see how they work. Uh, they are definitely very research-based and their waiting time is actually very long. You know? It takes about maybe up to a year before getting to see a doctor. So I think in Singapore, we are much luckier that we tend to be able to see a doctor uh, a lot sooner than that. Any conflicts of interest to declare? Uh, unfortunately, no. I'm not sponsored. There are no grants. Yeah, so uh, Brahm Center didn't pay me for today's talk. <laughs> Is this going to be a boring talk? <laughs> yes, I think it's going to be quite boring. Uh, but I'm going to try my best to make it interesting. What is obsessive compulsive disorder? Okay, so uh, actually for mental health condition, right, psychological conditions, we generally divide them into the mad, the sad, the bad. I don't think it's very politically correct to use some of these words anymore. But when I first started my training, that's how we differentiated them. So those that are kind of detached from reality, where they may hear voices or they feel that people are out to get them, these are like schizophrenia and delusional disorders. And then on the other hand, we have people with personality disorders. I mean, these are more often uh, begin very early in their life and often it's a result of their upbringing or their genes. And you know, it's, a lot of it is their, uh, part of their personality issues. And that's why they have to see us. So today, my focus on uh, the set, the set will include like mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and OCD. So generally in Singapore, we will use this uh, diagnostic uh, criteria from America's or this fifth version already. So in OCD, actually, uh, there is the O and the C part. O is the obsessions, and then C is the compulsion. Now, obsessions are not like uh, what we would use in daily life, right? Like a lot of people say I'm very obsessed with Apple products. So I would think about Apple products, right? Every time there's a new iPhone, I'll be like, well, I'm reading up all about it, I'm wanting to buy it, you know, queue up and go, to, go down to the store to wait for it. So it's a very happy thing. Uh, it's a very happy kind of session. I'm, I'm kind of very, uh, I really enjoy thinking about all these Apple products, right? But in uh, OCD obsession, they're not like that. Now, these thoughts, images, urges that intrude a person with OCD, intrude their mind, right? Actually makes them feel very uneasy. Uh, so it could be thoughts like, their hands are dirty or their body is dirty or that the door is not locked or that you know they have done something wrong they know it's not real but these thoughts just keep coming to their mind they know it's their own thoughts they know it's not real but they just make them very uneasy so these are obsessions so obsession is very different from like my kind of obsession right where i really enjoy the kind of uh thinking that i have whereas in the ocd obsession is something that is very unpleasant so what's a compulsion? A compulsion is generally a behavior or ritual that they will do to kind of negate the obsession. So for instance, in someone with uh, intrusive thoughts of contamination, so they think their hands are dirty, then the compulsion will be to wash their hands. Uh, when they wash their hands, the anxiety will go down a bit, so they don't feel so uneasy. But the next time those thoughts come in again, the anxiety go up, then they go and wash their hands again. Yeah, so the compulsion actually doesn't realistically negate the obsession, yeah, but it's used to reduce uneasiness. Now, many of us do have some OCD features, like I, even for me, you know, sometimes I'll go back to my car to make sure the door is locked, or go back to my room to make sure the lights are off. But it doesn't affect, if it doesn't affect our well-being, then it's not, then it's not a disorder. So it must really affect our well-being. Like it takes up maybe an hour a day, or because of that, we are not able to do our work uh, focus on our studies, then it becomes a disorder. So a bit of like 
uh, repetitive thoughts, a bit of hand washing doesn't qualify it as OCD. What are some common OCD symptoms? So uh, just now I talk about cleaning. So cleaning, checking, counting are the common ones. The cleaning one are, are like washing her hands. Another patient of mine is always worried that she might miss a step when she shower. So every time she showers, she has to go through a very specific uh, step. So you, have, you got to start from the head, then the face, then the body, etc. Now she will have this intrusive thought or this thoughts that she may have missed a step. As a result, she will have to start all over again. So you start washing from the hair again and then all the way to the feet. So by the time she, before she reached the feet, she probably have another thought that says that, oh, I think you missed a step again. Even though she knows she didn't miss it, but she will feel uneasy and then she'll redo the whole showering uh, thing over again. That's why she's stuck in the shower for maybe two to three hours. Also, so this is an example of cleaning and then checking, like I mentioned, could be like the door is not locked or the uh, stove uh, for her to switch off, or the lights for her to switch off, or the tap they didn't turn it off. So again, they know they did turn it off, but they have this uh, thought that comes to their mind that kind of raise their anxiety level, make them feel uneasy. So the ritual will be they will go back to check. So I have a patient which actually broke uh, her door knob because she keep checking to make sure the door is locked. Uh, other things would be like symmetry. This one actually David Beckham uh, famously said he had this condition. He needs to make sure, you know, everything on his table has to be symmetrical. Yeah, so uh, others that I also commonly see are like thoughts that make them feel uneasy because it's highly against their values. So for instance, they have sexual thoughts or violent thoughts. Or I have this patient uh, from Batam who came from Batam to see me. He always worried that there's pornography on his phone, even though he knows he's not there. So he has to keep checking his phone to make sure that there is no pornography on his phone. Yeah. So, so again, he knows that it's not true. Uh, it makes him feel uneasy. So he performs a ritual of checking his phone uh, to kind of reduce the uneasiness. And this goes on in a cycle for hours and hours. Yep. So these are the words that we talk about. Okay, I have another very interesting patient uh, who always think that he spits saliva on other people's uh, body. So whenever he's near uh, people, uh, he will scan their body for traces of watermark to make sure that he didn't spit saliva on their body. Yeah. So this is another one that is quite uh, unusual. Not so commonly seen like chicken counting or cleaning. How common is it? Actually, uh, the, it is quite common, like one in maybe 26. So uh, the Institute of Mental Health did a study in 2016, and they find that 3% of the population do suffer from OCD. Yeah. So it's among the more you know, common uh, psychological conditions. So, what's top on the list is uh, depression. Uh, then you have uh, OCD as number two. At what age does it happen? Okay, so uh, these are the kids from Hong Kong. Uh, who <laughs> it's just a tongue in cheek picture, but if you don't look at anybody in this picture, you are safe. So, you are not likely to get it if you're above the age of 25. Yeah, not likely, not, not impossible, but quite unlikely to get it if you are of this age already. Is it more in men or women? Yeah, the ratio is one is to one. What causes OCD? No, OCD is uh okay. So all psychological condition is okay. The science of psychological condition is that it is a combination of factors, the biological aspect, our personality, and our social circumstances. Now this is pretty much the same like uh the same like hypertension or diabetes. So let's say our uh, someone in our family has diabetes, then it's more likely we'll get it. So that's the biological aspect. Or in terms of the way we eat, you know, if we choose a lot of uh, you know, very red and healthy food, then our chance of getting diabetes is also higher. And then also our whether we exercise or not, you know. So the family culture will probably also affect our chance of getting diabetes, right? So let's say my mom likes to cook a curry or very unhealthy, untaps of unhealthy food like fried chicken wing or you know. Uh, oily food or salty food, then then my then it's very likely that when I grow up, I'll likely to like this kind of food also, right? So that's the analogy for psychological conditions. So for OCD, uh, there are genetic factors. It could be due to imbalance in the brain messengers. These are the neurotransmitter. They even found uh, changes in the brain structure. Sometimes they even attribute it to our immune system. So some childhood infection, uh, like the streptococcal infection of our throat, 
can increase our risk of uh, OCD. In terms of personality, uh, people who are more avoidant, uh, there are things like conditioning. So, so conditioning is when you pair, I won't go into too much detail, so it's, not, it's quite, quite, quite difficult to explain. And then other things are like psychological defenses, like you call it undoing. Yeah, so OCD actually is a lot more biological than most other psychological conditions. So you can see the biology circle is a bit uh, bigger than that. Some of my patients tell me when they're stressed, it also trigger their OCD symptoms to be more severe. Yeah, so it's a confluence of factors. So let's take a look at the neurotransmitter. So the brain chemicals are what the, or the brain messengers are what the nerve cells use to communicate with each other. So there are hypotheses that there are problems with some of this uh, brain uh, messenger and the receiver on the other side of the nerve cell. Uh, this is a picture of the brain. So in OCD, uh, there could, there's also a hypothesis that uh, there are problems with the front part of the brain and this part of the brain called the caudate lobe. Yeah. So, uh, interestingly, in some countries like America, they are a bit more advanced. Uh, in very intractable cases of OCD, it means that no matter what treatment they use, they don't get better. Uh, as a last resort, sometimes they will do, the brain surgeon will do surgery, and it is helpful to some extent. So, they'll cut off uh, that part of the brain that make them keep obsessing and keep uh, ruminating. Yeah, so brain surgery in overseas is actually an option. I haven't heard of it being done in Singapore so far. How are your patients like when they come to seek help? Unfortunately, uh, based on the same study, uh, it takes about 11 years for people with OCD before they come for the seek help compared to other conditions like depression or anxiety disorder or alcohol abuse. So OCD sufferers really takes a very long time before they even come for the seek help. So by the time they come and see me, usually they have it for a number of years. Uh, they are quite unwell already. You know? They have not been working. They are not married. They are not able to further their studies. So it's quite a debilitating condition. And they really take a long time before they come for OCD. Our audience may have a family member with OCD. Do you know how it is like for the family? Uh, yes. So uh, this is a picture from the Straits Times. Uh, this Mr. Key is actually a peer support worker at IPH. So he was very candid uh, in the press and he talks about how he has involved his family in his rituals. So he said he, he needs to check whether the refrigerator door is closed or not. So he'll keep opening and closing. And then when he got tired, he would ask his mother to take over. So the other patient I have who had to bathe in a specific sequence, right? So what she did was she was so scared that she would miss a step that she got her husband to get into the shower to help her to shower. So she no longer have that, uh, she don't have that courage to bathe herself anymore. Or another patient of mine who always clean the kitchen floor. So she spent like about one to two hours every day cleaning the kitchen floor before she would leave for work. And subsequently, she also got her children and her husband to get involved in her rituals, in her compulsion to clean the kitchen floor. So it can be quite uh, affecting for the family members. So here are some tips for those that are helping people with psychological conditions. Some tips like being more uh, empathetic. Be empathetic means to try to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. And you know, sometimes when our friends come to us for problems, we are very, we are very eager to give them uh, suggestions on how to manage things. Right? Like, let's say your friend is having a trouble at work. They'll say, quit, lah, you know, go to LinkedIn, go and search for a new job. So actually our friends or people with psychological uh, conditions, they are aware of what steps they can take. They, when they come to us, really they want to get, have a space, you know, a private space to kind of ventilate, not so much to ask us for solutions. So very important when you have friends who are, may not just be suffering from psychological condition or they're just stressed, they come to you, just give them that listening ear without judgment, without rushing to give any solutions. So being empathetic is something uh, very important. Uh, ask how they would like to be supported. Like you might not, not want to rush to give suggestions, but ask them, you know, what do you, how do you think I can help you? Uh, do things together with them, like you know, board games, cooking, watching TV, going for walks together. Uh, all this can help to kind of reduce stress for your loved ones. You know, give love, give positive encouragement. Uh, I can't see the last one. Yeah, look after yourself. Uh, so, so for many of us who have to be with People who, for instance, like dementia or other medical conditions, uh, we are, some of us are very self-sacrificing. They would you know, spend a lot of time looking after their loved ones, but always remember 
uh, to kind of carve out some time for yourself, even if it's just half an hour to, to exercise or do the things that you like is very important. Do you psychoanalyze your patient? Yeah, so this is a very common question you know, when my patients or even my friends say, oh, you're going to psychoanalyze me. You're going to try to read my mind. Actually, I don't have such uh, talent. I'm not a Professor X or a Jean Grey. Or, yeah. So, so this is an example of what patients think when they come and see lying on the couch and then just talking whatever comes to their mind. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the, I guess that leads to the next question. Yeah, seeing a psychiatrist sounds scary. How is it like? So this is how it's really like, it's really no different from seeing any other medical doctor. So you come to the room and then you sit down and then have a chit chat about what are the condition. You know, so you, my patient will come in and tell me a bit more about their symptoms and then you ask them about their background so I know them better. So like what school they went, what are their hobbies, uh, you know, uh, what their religion, how many members, family members they have, uh, what's their job, do they drink or smoke, do they have any problems a lot. So I'll ask them all this, uh, the, the symptoms that they are suffering from and then their background history. So generally, I'm, 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 I've gotten quite good. I'll, after 16 years of practicing, I can do this within 20 minutes. Eh? So uh, you won't be spending like two hours chatting with me. Of course, if you need more time, I'll give you more time. But generally, about half an hour, I'm in the first session, I'm able to get the gist of the problem already. So not very scary. I'm not, not going to psychoanalyze you. I don't have such talents. I'm trained in psychoanalysis. I'm more of a here and now kind of person. So what you tell me, I will. I will, I will just take it from here. And I will not ask you too much about your childhood, unless it's significant, of course. So this example of me doing video consult. So these days, because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, I used to be very resistant to video consult, but these days it's right, like bread and butter. So a lot of my friends, not my friends, but a lot of my clients will just, or patients will just reach me from their home. It's really a lot more convenient. They don't have to wait. They don't have to take leave to come down, wait, and then I'm quite punctual when it comes to video consult. I know they're waiting for me at 3.15 or a lot at 3.15. So uh, this is one of the measurement skills that we can use for patients. So this one is a more objective way of measuring how severe the symptoms is. It's called the uh, Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. Uh, it's more done for research, but uh, some of the doctors, they do use this for their patients just to see how severe are the symptoms and whether they're responding. Does it mean I'm crazy? Yeah, so again, a lot of people do not want to see a, a doctor that specializes in psychological well-being because they are worried that they might be labeled as crazy. Uh, really, there is still a lot of stigma, although I think today is getting a lot better. So for all the audience in the crowd, you know, even in your day-to-day -day language, don't use words like crazy, mad, or xiao. You know? I like to, you know, some, some people like to say crazy, crazy rich Asian, right? Yeah, so, so try not to use this in your jargon if you can, or gila, you know, or psycho. And sometimes there's this misconception that uh, psychological conditions are only affect people who are weak. Now, that's absolutely nonsense. Now, anybody can get it, even if you are very strong personality, you can get it. Because it's like I said just now, it's a confluence of your genes, of your personality, of your, of your social well-being. So there's no such thing as strong and weak when it comes to medical condition or they lack willpower. Again, these are very stigmatizing statements, you know. Uh, do you forget? Sometimes I have my, one of my patients tell me she don't want to take medicine. Because people like to use this phrase, right? When, when, when people like to say, oh, do you forget to take your medicine today? Now, even my colleagues like to say that about me. They always say I'm very crazy, although they shouldn't use such words as, as psychiatrists, but sometimes they even tell me, hey, you forgot to take your medicine today. So again, don't, don't, don't say such things. It may not affect you, but it can affect people around us. Now. So I, I'm actually quite a keyboard warrior. Like on Instagram, if I see people using these kind of words, I will, I will write a comment. I will flag it out as inappropriate. I remember one time, eight days, uh, used the word schizophrenia to describe the way the uh, Singapore celebrity dress. So I was quite upset about that. So I said, hey, if you're going to use the word schizophrenia to describe the way people dress it. I think what they meant was like, it was a clash clash of colors and style. Yeah, but uh, I'm quite a keyboard warrior. When I see all these advertising words, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll highlight it. So a bit about stigma. Uh, this it was a paper, uh, was a article that was published in the Straits Times on the Sunday Times. So it shows that there's still a lot of stigma in Singapore. Like they say that um, you know, now six in ten believe that mental health conditions are caused by lack of self discipline and willpower. Yeah, like what I said just now. Or five in ten believe that people with uh, mental health conditions should not be given any responsibility, and more than five in ten are not willing to live with 
uh, work with someone with a mental health condition. So still a lot of stigma. Uh, I think just because we have a psychological condition doesn't mean that we are dangerous. Again, that's not true. You're more likely to be dangerous if you don't have a psychological condition rather than you have. Yeah, so let's hope that as the days and the years goes by, the stigma in uh, psychological well-being will go down. How much time do you spend with your patient? Yeah, I was a bit on the fence of whether I want to share this. Or not. So a lot of my patients think they get to spend a lot of time with me when they come and see me. So this is an example of my list on a typical morning. So you can see 9 o'clock, 30 minutes, 9.30, 30 minutes, right? But I've got two cases at 9.30. 10, 10 o'clock, 10, 10, 10, 20, 10, 30, 10, 40, 10, 30, 10, 11 o'clock, 11, 10, 11, 30, 11, 40. So I see about 13 to 14 uh, patients every morning with three new cases. La. So I have a KPI to hit. La. Unfortunately, we need to see, we cannot be like America, right? Wait one year, then you come and see me. So we have to be quite efficient. Of course, if, if, if my clients or my patients need more time, I definitely give it to them. But we're not going to sit down and chit chat about everything. <laughs> I have a pressure. La. So... Uh, every doctor is like that. La. Now, with the psychologist, or later I'll talk about the psychologist, it's a bit better because for therapy, we cannot do it in 10 minutes. Yeah, but sometimes you'll be surprised. A lot of my patients want to get out of my room within five minutes already. They're just like, oh, I'm very good. My anxiety is a lot better. My mood is a lot better. Yeah, I, I, I just want to get my medication. I'm brushing off to work already. So some people don't want to spend much time talking to me. Doesn't mean all 13 patients will turn up. La. My default rate is about, about 20%. So everybody do gets a bit more than 10 minutes. What is the difference between psychologist and psychiatrist? Yeah, a lot of people don't know what's the difference or they use it interchangeably. So uh, actually, a psychologist is someone who do therapy. Uh, they probably did psychology in university and then they have a master's in clinical psychology. Whereas a psychiatrist like me is someone who went to medical school and then after we become a doctor, we decide to specialize in different things. Actually, to be very, very honest, I wanted to be a pediatrician. But after medical school, I realized I'm really very bad at my hands. I cannot even do a knot properly. So I, I, I'm also very bad at hearing uh, sounds from the heart and the lungs. I actually realized I have quite a talent for uh, psychiatry when I was a medical student. That's why I decided to pursue psychiatry. And I was really very interested in it. Yeah. So uh, the analogy would be like an orthopedic doctor or a sports physician and a physiotherapist. So the psychiatrist is the orthopedic surgeon. The psychologist is the physiotherapist. So that's one way you can see. How do you treat OCD? Okay, so just now we talked about how a uh, psychological condition like any other medical condition often is due to these three factors. So in terms of intervention, we also use these three ways, uh, medication, therapy, and kind of getting the family on board to help. Remember, we talked about the family who get very involved in the ritual. So one thing we tell the family members to do is not to kind of buy into the ritual. Don't reinforce the ritual. So don't help them to clean. Encourage them actually to stop or encourage them to get out of the shower. Already. Yeah. So rather than to go into the shower to help them to shower, encourage them to step out of the shower after a certain number of minutes, like after 30 minutes, you know, kind of encourage them to step out of the shower, not to continue in this cycle of obsession and compulsion. Can you tell us what medicine you use? So the medicine we use for OCD uh, generally is uh, SSRI, tricyclic antidepressant and a assortment of other medications. Again, I will not go into the details. Uh, it's not meant to be a medical lecture. So, uh, but suffice to say, the medicine that we use for OCD are the same ones that we use for depression. But generally, we need to use them at much higher doses. For instance, if it's one tablet for depression, you may have to go up to two or three or even four tablets for OCD. And for depression, generally, we see the benefits very quickly. Like after one or two weeks, the patient will start to feel a lot better. But for OCD, Sometimes it takes up to two to three months before we will see any changes. So the doctor and the patient have to be both very uh, patient. Uh, the good news is most people do respond to medicine. Yeah, most people with OCD will respond to medicine. So that's very good news. Is it addictive? Again, a common question my patient asks me is, oh, I don't want to take medicine. It's, I'm going to get addicted to it. I'm going to be dependent on it. So no, my medicine are no different from the medicine that you may use for high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, and you know, I, I use hair loss medicine. Honestly, I've been taking it for many, many years already, so my hair looks so thick. Like, <laughs> I won't say I'm addicted to my hair loss medicine, but I'm definitely dependent on my hair loss medicine. I don't want to stop either. Yeah, so my medicine are not uh, cigarettes. They are not uh, beer. Yeah, you're not going to get addicted to it. You're not, you're not going to get high on it. 
Yeah, you definitely not, not look for it if you forgot to take it. Do I have to take it forever? Uh, no, just uh, one to two years first. Uh, take for one to two years, then we will probably try and stop and see whether the OCD comes back. So if my client is lucky, uh, we can stop and then the OCD becomes very manageable. If they're not lucky, maybe after six months, the OCD symptoms may come back. Then they need to discuss whether they want to restart medicine or they want to go to therapy. Is it going to harm my liver? Uh, my, the medicine are actually very safe. Uh, most people do not even get any side effects, but if they do, they may feel a bit uneasy in the first week. Uh, like most medicine, they might get a bit of nausea. So it's good to take like a biscuit or half a slice of bread before they take the medicine. Some people do sleep more after taking the medicine. Some people sleep less. So if they sleep more, they take it in the morning. You sleep, uh, sleep more, they sleep. Uh, if they feel sleepy, I'll take the medicine, take it at night. If they feel quite alert, I'll take the medicine, then take it in the morning. Yeah, so uh, it don't affect the liver unless the liver already had a problem. So if the liver, like a person with hepatitis, might not be able to take some of this medicine. Yeah, but it's not going to affect the liver. And it's not going to affect the liver, but if the person has a liver problem, then maybe we can use this medicine. Is it compulsory to take, med to take medicine? Uh, no, it's not compulsory to take medicine. So for patients, many of my patients don't want to take medicine. So they will go for therapy instead. Yeah. So it's not compulsory. You're always in the driving seat. Uh, as doctors, we are just here to give you some advice on what I would encourage you to do, but I'm not going to compel you. So again, uh, my clients are always in the driving seat. You can take medicine. You can choose to go for therapy. But of course, it's good to do something. Like I can guarantee if you don't do anything, you're not going to get, you're not get better. But if you try, there's a good chance that you might improve. I am taking this medicine called ABC now. Is it the right one for me? Yeah, this is a very common question that I get when I do public forums. Everybody will raise their hands and they always say, oh, my, my daughter or my son, or I'm taking this medicine, do you think it's the right one for me? Now, my reply to that is, I don't know. Yeah, and the reason why I say that is because I really don't know about your condition enough to make a judgment on whether the medicine is the right one or the wrong one. So, as I mentioned just now, if you were to come and see me, I'll be spending about 30 minutes to kind of understand a bit more of your symptoms, a bit more of your background, and then I'll choose the medicine accordingly. Yeah. So there's no one size fit all. And sometimes the first medicine may not work. Yeah. So they, when they come back after a few weeks, they tell me, oh, after, after two or three months, they really zero improvement in this medicine. Then I'll try something else. Because there are really many medications that I can use, right? So we, we, we try to see whether another one may have some effects. Okay? So when you ask me whether your medicine is right, one, well, I really cannot tell you because I really don't know your condition or what medicine you have been, whether you have other medical conditions. Okay? Yeah. So uh, if you had asked me that question on the chat, you can, you, this will be my standard answer to you. What about therapy? Is it just talking? Yeah, so uh, yeah, therapy is not just talking. Therapy is something actually very manualized. So for instance, when I do therapy with my patient, I do uh, follow steps. So generally, we are told to do different things during different sessions. Now, most therapy will take at least 10 sessions. Each session is about uh, one hour. Uh, and there will be an intake session. And then session one will be intake session. Session two and session nine will be about doing the work to manage the OCD. And then session 10 will be the exit uh, session. So it's not just uh, talking. This is my colleague, Mark, he's a psychologist. So uh, uh, here he's demonstrating the therapy for OCD. It's called exposure and response prevention. Actually, that's not for exposure and response prevention, but this is a photo I've taken for him. So later I'll tell you a bit more about what is exposure and response prevention. So this is the, uh, this is the gold standard for the treatment of OCD. How do you do therapy in OCD? So uh, usually... For therapy in OCD, there must be two things that we need to do, exposure and response prevention. So the client has to be exposed to the thing that raised their uh, uneasiness. So for instance, someone who is uh, afraid of dirt on their hands, they may have to purposely go and touch the floor, and not just any floor, maybe the floor in the common corridor. And the response prevention part is the client cannot wash his hands. Yeah. So there's two parts to it. So touch something that makes them feel uncomfortable and then don't go, go and wash their hands. Of course, usually we don't make them not wash their hands forever. Lah. We ask them to like bear with it for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, then go and wash their hands. So as we keep getting ourselves exposed to things that make us 
feel uneasy and then we don't go and carry out the ritual to undo it, we eventually will get habituated to the uh, thing that makes us uneasy. So every time we expose ourselves to dirt, we get more and more uh, used to it. And then after a while, we don't feel so uneasy anymore. It's a bit like stage fright, right? Like when I first gave this talk, I will always, uh, to Brahm Center, I'm very panicky. You know, I will be like, oh my gosh, every time I give this talk, and then I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to say something silly. There's going to be a lot of us and us. I'm sure there's a lot of us and us if you play back. So, but today, you know, by this number, after a number of times, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to give the talk. You know, just now I went to have chicken rice first and then check some email, etc. cetera. I know I don't feel anxious anymore simply because I've done this a number of times. Yeah, so the uneasiness have gone down a lot for me. So this is another example for a client of mine. So what we did is to come up with a hierarchy of things that make her feel uneasy. And then uh, she has to rate how uneasy each of these activities makes her uh, feel. And then she will do them sequentially. So we don't throw at the deep end of the pool. Right? So we start with something easy. So for something easy that only costs a 10 upon 100 kind of distress, it's close to bridge, do not check. So that was something very easy for her. Close to bridge, do not check. So she'll do this first. Then subsequently, she went up to unplugging the iron, do not check. Then later, when she is able to overcome this, she will do the close the main door, do not check. So she leaves the house, close the main door, she do not check. So the most scary for her is not to call the father whether he has reached the office safely. So this was the toughest for her. So she got to keep doing all this. And the more she does it, uh, the better her OCD will get. So a lot of misconception is we come to see a therapist, we just chit chat and then uh, nothing happens. No, we just go home, right? No. So actually, when you go home, you do have to do all these experiments to see, uh, to, to see whether you get better or not. So it's not good enough to just come and see us. When you go back, you have to carry out all these experiments. Yeah, so it takes a lot of motivation on the client's part as well. Is therapy just once off? Uh, no. Yeah. So as I mentioned, usually 10 or more, usually about one hour each time, once per month. Yeah. So, so at, at least about 10 sessions. Do your patients all go for therapy? Yeah, actually many do want to go for therapy, but after two to three sessions, many also stop going. Because after two to three sessions, they're unlikely to see any benefit yet. You know, it's like learning to play the piano. You know, you go, go to two to three sessions, don't expect to know how to play the piano. Right? So really you go for at least 10 lessons before, uh, you, you go for at least five to six lessons before you feel better. Uh, now going for therapy is not easy. You know, you've got to take leave, you've got to come down to the hospital, uh, you've got to wait. You see a therapist, after that, you've got to wait again to pay. And then you take the MRT home or you drive home. So half a day is gone. Uh, fortunately, today there's virtual consult. Uh, so at least you can do from home or from office. You need to find a quiet room, although not all of us have the luxury of a quiet room. So uh, yes, many want to go, but many do give up. Many, many do give up after two, two to three sessions. So the motivation, not quite there. Sometimes I encourage my patients to go, but if they're not very keen, I won't force them also because you cannot really force them to go. They will just go for one session, give you a face, and then they will, they will go in. How do I get my family to seek help? Again, another very common question that many of you are going to ask me. So I, I, I think some tips for family is uh, even something that I always tell my family members. Uh, we got a new uh, help. Uh, it really drove my mom up the wall. Uh, she, my mom is a very old-fashioned woman. Yeah. She's in her 80s and she has her own perception of domestic help, right? So I've been telling her, please be patient and kind, please be patient and kind. <laughs> I think this is something all of us really have to encompass. You know, uh, I, I think it's something that Brahm Center talks a lot about too. You know, develop some cultivate patience and kindness towards everybody. You know, everybody, including our loved ones who may suffer from a psychological condition. Be patient, be kind. Uh, try not to argue. You know, really, you can't argue a person who say Show a lot of understanding, like I said earlier. You don't have to rush to give solution. And when you express your concerns, try to use me statements rather than you statements. Now, what do I mean by that? A you statement could be, I think you are not well. I think you should see a doctor. So that's very, I don't know, it just sounds very antagonistic. So use me statements instead. Like, I'm worried for you. I think you are not doing so well. It, it hurts me to see you are suffering. You know? So me statements do come across as being more acceptable. Give hope. Yeah, tell, tell our family members, our loved ones. I think you can get better. You know, I think psychological conditions are very treatable. Finding a common ground to seek help is also very important. Sometimes my patients come and see me and they really don't want to come, right? Their family member force them to come and see me. So what I try and do is to find a common ground. Like, you know, I generally will tell them that you know, like, I cannot help you if you don't want to seek help. You know, I'm powerless. That's, that's the truth, right? So find a common ground could be like, but you know, I noticed that you are here today. 
why do you even come if you didn't want to seek help? Then sometimes they may say something like, uh, oh yeah, I came here for my family, for my mom, or for my wife, or for my husband. So then we'll talk about, okay, so let's then talk about how we can work along these lines instead. So trying to find a common ground, right? Well, so talk about family, talk about the spouse, and so find a common ground for them to seek help. So maybe to your loved ones, they may not be so worried about the OCD, but maybe they are more concerned about work or their studies. Then use that as a reason to encourage them to seek help. Now, when give, giving people, people options to seek help, also try to give more than one option. Now. And when you only give one option, it's not really giving options, right? So it's like telling your, uh, uh, telling your maybe you know, your loved ones, you know, I think you need to see a doctor. I think you need to go to the, see a psychiatrist. If you want to give one option, it's not very fair, right? So maybe give two options. Like you want to see the GP or you want to see a psychiatrist or you want to see the polyclinic doctor or you want to see a psychiatrist. So give, give people options when you... Uh, even though both are not very pleasant options, still give more than one option. It's like encouraging your kids to eat vegetables, right? Do you want broccoli or do you want spinach? Yeah, it just comes across as something better, isn't it? Who is the best doctor slash therapist? Yeah, again, this is a very common question. Like, who is the number one? Yeah, there's no such thing as number one, actually. Uh, uh, everybody will have different uh, chemistry uh, and they look out for different things. Uh, but if you are picking, trying to pick a doctor or therapist, some tips, personally, like when uh, my family member had a couple tunnel syndrome, actually, I don't know any hand surgeon. Right? So for uh, inside, this is an insider tip. Like, take a look at which university you graduate from. Try to find some university that's a bit more decent. Look at the years of experience. The, uh, I think 10 years or so is good. Uh, means they are still quite, <laughs> they are they're experienced enough, but still quite updated with the, more recent technology and the more recent literature. Then take a look at which public hospital this person has practiced before and what was his position in the department. Generally, when I bring my loved ones to seek help, I generally look for the health department. Actually, I learned this from my sister. When I was young, my sister, when she go and go to the barber or go to the hair stylist, right, she always asked for the manager. She would say, oh, I want the manager to cut my hair. So that's where I, I realized, hmm, okay, makes some makes sense. Look for the manager, right? look for the health department. Where to seek subsidized healthcare? Okay, you can, if you want to get subsidized healthcare, healthcare, then go to the polyclinic first to get a referral. I'm not sure if this is the most updated picture, but there's many polyclinics around Singapore. Go there, speak to the doctor, explain your condition and that you want to see a specialist, then you refer, then you'll pay a subsidized rate, which is a lot more affordable. Now, when you look for a subsidized, when you go through this route, you cannot pick doctor. So that's something you need to bear in mind. You cannot say, I want to see the health department. Yeah, if you go by subsidized route, you cannot pick doctor you'll be randomly allocated. If everybody picks doctor through the subsidized route, then the junior doctors will have no work to do and the health department will be very busy, right? Yeah, so every, it has to be, there has to be, it cannot be, it cannot be fast, cheap, and good one. Huh? Something got to give, right? There's no such thing as fast, cheap, and good. You know, I went to Durian Cellar, you want, they will tell you something very vulgar when you ask for fast, cheap, and good, right? So uh, if you get, if you, you're a Hawkeye speaking, you know the joke. But so, so do realize if you go through a subsidized route, you cannot pick up. So, yep. Can I see you? <laughs> Again, yes. Another common question I get during public forums that people want to see me. Uh, go, go and Google my name. And yes, you can see me. 